Okay. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. Amma ba'ad. So, Bismillah. Today we are going to begin talking about uh, our mothers and the personal life of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because, you know, we keep talking about the wars, we talk about the battles, about the Makki period, the trials and tribulations, what Taif has done. But we also need to have an insight in his personal life because there are things going on in his personal life that we have not discussed. So today is kind of like a break from all the battles and Hudaybiyah and, the, and those things. So it's nice. If you don't have a background, no problem. You're going to be introduced to it today. So Bismillah. So 13 years of Makkah are over. And we have 10 years of the life of Prophet in Medina. We have covered Azab. We have covered Hudaybiyah. After Hudaybiyah, the next year, we are now going to have Battle of Khaybat, which Ali radiallahu is going to be asked to march forth, and he's going to provide the victory at the hands of Allah, of course. Um, so after Khaybat, you should understand, there's a big sea change happening in the life of the Muslims in Medina. Khaybat is like the uh, cities of GCC, the Middle East. Those oil-rich cities, which make the entire Middle East so rich, Khaybat is like that. It is a super rich city. If you remember in Azab, what did the guy from Khaybar, Banu Nadir guy, what did he say to Abu Sufyan? I'll give you half the produce of Khaybar to Ghatafan, convince Ghatafan to come on our side and attack Medina. Half the produce of a city. That's not just a city, it's like a, the wealth of a country. So once the Sahaba finally got the Ghanim of Khaybar, when the Jews had to start giving the money, now the Muhajir have their own houses, their own land, their own business. Now they're not dependent on on. The Ansar, of course, the Prophet and Muakha, they all had partners. The incident I'm talking about today is a dispute that the Prophet Muhammad had with all of his wives. All of his wives. And this is happening in the later stage of Medina. And I know that, especially in the subcontinent, they have usually they've just sanitized the events, not to mention this, which is the reason why we have a stigma for divorce, for the way the Prophet has behaved with his wife and everything. The problem with this kind of a culture is that the more you stigmatize these things, the more you make Prophet Muhammad into a superhuman, which he's not. If Allah wanted, he could have made the most blissful, perfect marriage for the Rasulullah. All the wives are happy, everybody's happy, life is great. You know what you would have said, what I would have said, if 1400 years later our wife would have had a problem and somebody says you should not be yelling at your wife or you should not be having any tips with your wife or let her speak when she wants to say something against you. I would have, and he said, this is a sunnah of the Rasulullah, look how happy his wives are. My reaction and your reaction would be, well, that's the Rasulullah. He was perfect. Everybody loved him. My wife is not like that. You would have blamed your wife. Even now, people blame the wife because of that, right? So this is the problem that you have over 1,400 years, especially in the subcontinent and these countries where they've made like a literal a superhuman out of the Rasulullah. They've made a Jibreel, alayhi salam, out of him. This is going down the path of the Christians. That's what the Christians have done with Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We don't want to go down that road. So today, inshallah, after you leave from this one, you will realize the humanity of everybody involved. Marital dispute between the wives. And so there has been, now many, how many of you know that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has in his lifetime divorced one of his wives? Nobody knew this. So you see, this is the reason why from the countries we are coming from, divorce is stigmatized. Divorcee. Hafsa radiallahu the daughter of Umar radiallahu anh, was divorced. And then Jibreel Islam came back and said, Allah has asked him to take her back. That's a different story. We're going to talk about that today. Yes, divorce is a necessary, I don't want to say evil, but it is a necessary tool, a road. We need this. You know, in the India Hindu culture, they don't have a divorce. There's no system of divorce. Now the Indian government in 19 something, 47 or 42 or something, they passed a Hindu marriage act which allows a girl to be able to divorce. It is not the scriptures that are saying that you can divorce. It is the government doing an amendment. We don't need amendment because we gave the power for the girl to be able to separate. In, in Hindi, they call it kanyadan. Have you heard of this term, kanyadan? You know what that means? Yeah. It's a Hindi word, right? Kanya means female, ladki, and dan means charity. Now, on the face of it, it sounds like a beautiful thing. Oh, you're giving your daughter in charity to the husband. It's not. You know why they call it charity in their culture? It's because, can you imagine if somebody, let's say I give charity to somebody. I give, hey, here's 10 bucks, here's 100 bucks, whatever. And then later I'm in need of this money. Can you imagine the guy who goes to this guy, hey, remember I gave you those 100 bucks? I need it back. Imagine you go to some homeless guy here is asking for something, you give him money, 
two days later, the grocery inflation is killing you. So you come back to that guy who's still standing and say, hey, remember I gave you 100 bucks? Give me the money back. Who would do this? Nobody would do this, right? It is unthinkable somebody would do this. That's what they think in the Hindu culture about their daughters. You see this mentality that they are properties. I'm giving you a gift as dan. What that means is do whatever you like with this. See, if I give a gift to somebody, 100 bucks, homeless guy. Two days later, I see that he's playing some homeless friends and he's having a game, a backgammon maybe for money, he's gambling. I can't go and say, hey, I gave you this 100 bucks, I'm going to tell you how to use it. You can't use it for this. I can't do that. It's his money. He can do whatever he wants. That's the cultural thinking of the Hindus that I've given my daughter to this man. Do whatever you please. I can't take her back. That's why in the Hindu culture, and unfortunately Muslims have learned from this culture in that subcontinent, and they've imported the filth of this, that do whatever you want with the wife, but you cannot come back to our house now because you are done. You have been given. That's kanyadan. Nikah is not kanyadan. The girl has every right to question you, to oppose you, and you'll see today. And she can even ask to separate from you if you can't do what, what, what you're supposed to do for her. And there are so many incidents, of course, I'm not going to cover all, but this is going to be a good, nice lecture for us to understand how to behave with our wives. So understand, what do we want versus what do the women want, if you know this in general. When we buy stuff, when we buy Lamborghini, the Porsche, or whatever we buy, we don't really buy it for the sake of the Lamborghini. We buy it because we know she likes it. And that's how we will attract like a magnet. You know, I'm talking about a person, like, Mahar, why do you do Mahar? Why do you gather money for Mahar? You want the girl to like you. What do you think the girl likes? They like those things. They like the Lamborghini. They like the gold. They like the jewelry. You understand? And so this is the way Allah has made us. We like other things and the girls like something else. So this is how we are made. It is not at all a problem if your wives, my wife, or the wives of the Rasulullah sallallahu ask for more money, ask for material things, okay? They are not the Prophet, they are the wives of the Prophet. And so what happened is after Khaybar, everybody has money. Everybody is doing really good, relatively. And so there came a time when the wives said, we need a better lifestyle than what we are living. Now realize, if inshallah one day I'll show you on, on the screen, some, we have some pictures um, of the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the mosque, the, the houses and everything, inshallah we'll do a whole uh, overview lecture on that and you can see uh, house of Hafsa, house of Aisha that are now connected to the masjid and everything. If you, if you see those pictures, the life is really poorer than the poorest village you can think of today, right? But they're seeing the other Sahaba are now having a good life. It is natural for your wife to say, why can't I have it? That's fine. The girls, that's what they talk to each other. So they started pushing the Rasulullah so that they wanted certain things. This is after Khaybar. This is in the later stages of Medina. By this time, the Romans are now going to be a, a threat. The Romans, the book is going to happen eventually. Next to the Roman Empire, there is a group of Arabs called Ghassanids. Have you heard of Ghassanids? Okay. Ghassanids, you remember Ghatafan and Quraysh and we have Khaybar? Ghassanids are the northernmost Arab tribe who are actually Christians. So they are Arab Christians. So completely influenced by the Roman Empire. They're trading with them and everything. And they're the hired mercenaries of Romans. So if the Romans have any problem, they have a buffer army of Ghassanids. They can use them to attack. So they are Arabs, but they're Christians. There was a threat to the Muslims now from the Ghassanids. Khaybar is gone, taken over. Jews are not, they are completely neutralized at the threat. Quraysh has signed the treaty now. We've done Hudaybiyah. Quraysh is pacified. The money is flowing. The Muslims are converting left, right, and center everywhere. Hudaybiyah is the Fath Mubina, remember? Because Muslims are converting and converting. Before I tell you what happens when a, when a neighbor of Umar comes banging on his door in the middle of the night, says, open up, open up, open up. Uh, hurry up and Umar Dhanan opens up after Isha, it's night time after Isha, they used to all sleep. Today we watch TV and all that, but they used to sleep after Isha. After Isha, he opens up, he says, what happens? Have the Ghassanids attacked? And the neighbor says, no, something much worse has happened. The Prophet has divorced all his wives. Now he did not divorse, this is what he's saying. You know, a rumor goes from, uh, from one to hundred. So he says, the Prophet has divorced all his wives. Notice this, he's saying something worse has happened. Something worse than Ghassan is attacking. So in the minds of the Sahaba, the fact that our mothers are not going to be our mothers is something worse than even if the Ghassan is literally attacked us. That's how they look at it. 
So before I tell you what happens now, Umar obviously is going to rush to his daughter, Hafsa, who is married to the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I need to tell you previously something has happened because he's going to come and he's going to say things. So in the past, what has happened is Umar al is strong and he, people are scared of him. Sahaba were scared of him. We all know this. But you see, our wives are different. You could be a king in front of your friends and you go home and your wife is your wife, right? He, uh, one of his wives replied back to him and he said something. Talked back with the same ferocity as if it's a big deal or something. But he responded like, how dare you respond back to me when I speak to you? And she goes, you? Even the wives of the Rasulullah respond back to the Rasulullah, who are you? Okay, and we all can relate to it, inshallah. He's like, what? What did you just say? The wives, because that's his daughter, in, in part of that, right? His daughter, Hafsa Adilawan, is the daughter of Umar. He says, what? The wives of the Rasulullah don't, don't talk to him? Sometimes abandon him for a whole day? And talk back at him when he says something that they don't like? Are you serious? He says, yes, all the wives do this. Okay, so he goes back, he forgets his own anger. He goes to his daughter, Hafsa Adilawan. He says, is it true that you abandoned the Rasulullah for a whole day? You don't talk to him all day? Now, before I tell you her reaction and everything, please understand, this is important. Our mothers have an exception like no other. If any Sahabi ever talked back to the Rasulullah, Astaghfirullah, it has never happened, but if somebody did that, this is kufr. This is kufr, of course. Remember Hudaybiyah, when we came closest to disobeying the Rasulullah, like, I'm not going to do this, how can we accept this, Rasulullah? But you understand the wives have, give, have been given this right by Allah. You can talk back to your husband. You can be angry with your husband. There are things you can do within confines, bounds of reason. And so when Umar is looking at this behavior, he's looking at it from a perspective of Sahabi. Whereas, and of course, this is, he's the father and he has all the right to say whatever he wants to his daughter. This is the father we are talking about. But his wife... Our mother, she is the wife of the Rasulullah. She is not just married to Rasul of Allah, but she's also having a husband. And she, if she's not going to go to her husband to complain, to say something, or she's having a bad day, who's she going to go to? So understand, from her perspective, she seems like it's not a big deal, whereas Umar cannot believe my own daughter is doing this. And I know we are biased toward Umar, he being right, because we are all men. We cannot think from that perspective. But keep this in mind before we proceed. So Umar Zalan says, is it true that you don't talk to Rasulullah all day? And so Hafsa, she says, why are you just talking about me? Everybody does this. It's not just me. Like, you know, Aisha, my best friend. They were best friends. Just so you know, the wives of the Rasulullah were in two camps, generally speaking. Aisha and Hafsa were like best friends, but also sometimes they were competitors. And Sophia was a part of this group. Whereas on the other group, you had Zainab bint Jahash and Umm Salama. Remember we talked about Umm Salama in Hudaybiyah? That's Umm Salama. She was known as the Lady of Wisdom. So you have Aisha. You have Hafsa, and on this side you have Zainab, who was quite angry. She used to get angry, and she had Ghida. She had positive jealousy for the Rasulullah. And Umm Salama, the lady of wisdom. So he says, all the wives do this. Why are you just looking at me like this? You know, Umar, my father. And so he warns her. He says, don't let your prettier partner delude you into thinking that you can get away with anything. What is he saying? He's saying, don't think just because your prettier partner, Aisha, from this we learn that Aisha then was pretty, our mother. Don't think just because she can get away with some things by saying something to the Rasulullah that you too can get away with it. And we understand this for our kids. We understand this even if we, have, we don't have multiple wives in this day and age. But you cannot love everybody the exact same way. Again, if somebody marries more than one in our generation as well, understand you're not asked to love every single wife the same. No, it is impossible for you to love everybody exactly the same. It's impossible. You will have more bias towards somebody for something. What you have to do is justice. Despite wanting to favor one, you can't do that. Same for kids. You might have a kid who listens to you, who's obeying you, who's nice, he sleeps on time, he's getting A grades, and the other kid doesn't do all that well. This does not give you the right now to take your favorite kid to McDonald's and the other kid has to go to sleep. No, no party for you. You can't do that. But you are allowed to love one son more than the other. That's fine. Same thing with the wives. You have to do justice. You don't have to love them all the same because that's lying to yourself. So the, we all know that Rasulullah liked, of course, after Khadija, he liked Aisha more than the rest. And when Aisha herself was asked, who do you think the Prophet Muhammad loved the most? She said, I never asked this question to the Prophet, but 
I always believed after me, it would have been Umm Salama and Zainab bint Jahsh. Those were my main competitors against in the other group. Now, even uh, Hafsa and Aisha, they don't used to compete with each other for the love of the Rasulullah. I'll give one example. But Prophet Muhammad also used to usually, usually take one wife on an expedition. Usually, Umm Salama and Hudaybiyah. But in this particular event, in this particular case, uh, he once took Hafsa and Aisha together in different camels, different Hawdaj. Hawdaj is this little um, tent-like thing that you set up on the camel. So there's complete hijab, complete coverage. So Hafsa, who was clever, she's the daughter of Umar. She says to Aisha, hey, let's, let's have some fun today. How about I switch your Hawdaj and you came, come into mine? So let's exchange our Hawdaj. You sit in mine and I'll sit in yours. So it will be something fun because the Prophet will come and you'll see someone else, like, he'll be amazed and so it will be fun. So let's do that. So Aisha said, she's still young. She says, okay, let's do it. She thinks it's going to be fun. Once they, she goes and sits in Hafsa then on Saudaj, and Hafsa then on sitting in Aisha then on Saudaj, and they start going, the Prophet used to have a habit as they're going, he would then ride alongside one of his wives, Haudaj. Inevitably, like I said, you cannot control who you love, most of the time, he would want to park with whom? Walk with whom? Aisha. Anha. So guess where he comes? He comes to Aisha. Anha, but who's sitting inside? Hafsa. So he sees Hafsa. What a surprise. Okay, but then he, he's going to talk to Hafsa now because she's the one who's sitting there. And Aisha is sitting in her tent now realizing that she has been taken for a ride. She became so angry with herself. Why did I agree with this? I should have realized the Prophet loves me <laughs> a lot. And so he would inevitably have come to my house. This Hafsa, she got the better of me. She became so angry. So, uh, Allah has forgiven everybody. She became so angry that she took her, like, stuck her foot outside and felt some thorns on the way. This is dark time, night, night time. So she literally intentionally pushed her foot onto the thorns to the point where it will seep blood, seeping blood out of anger. Intentionally, like, why did I fall for this? Like, she was so angry that she fell for this, uh, this trap. I'm just giving an example of, you see this ghira, this positive jealousy. Everybody loves the Rasulullah And so, everybody has this. Now that you understand this, we now know that Aisha, Zalaunha, she can get away with things that some other otherwise cannot get away with. But anyway, let's get back to what we were talking about. Umar Zalaun goes to his daughter and says, is it true? You abandoned the Rasulullah? You don't talk to the Rasulullah all day? She said, yeah, everybody does that, not just me. Why are you looking at me? He says, don't let your prettier partner fool you into thinking that you can get away with the same thing that she can get away with. And were it not for me, and he's a little harsh with his daughter, were it not for me, that I'm, he's the best friend of the Rasulullah, like after Abu Bakr, were it not for me, the Prophet would have left you a long time ago, considering your behavior. So he's warning his daughter, don't behave like this with the Rasulullah. Then he says, and she's still kind of defending herself. And she's like, what? I just, we just talk to the Rasulullah. Sometimes we don't like something. We just say what we don't like. So he says, are you not fearful of Allah? What if you anger Allah when you, when you are angering Rasulullah? So for him, of course, for us, when we look at the Prophet of Allah, we always we never just say Prophet Muhammad. We do Prophet Muhammad, Rasul Allah of Allah. So if Astaghfirullah, we say anything to the Rasulullah, if he would have been there, obviously we will be fearful of, of, uh, of making Allah upset. But the wives have that discount like I've discussed, right? The wives have a discount where they're talking just to their husband. That is the human being that is, that is the Rasulullah Anyway, so realize this has happened. It will eventually happen that the Prophet Muhammad is going to divorce Hafsa because of an incident that happens, which I'm going to skip today. Inshallah, another time we'll do it. It is a heavy incident to discuss. Something happened where Allah revealed in the Quran that you too, Allah says you too, why? It's in Surah Tahreem. Surah Tahreem is 12 verses. It's all about Aisha and Hafsa, their behavior. They did something. They plotted and planned something um, about the Rasulullah asking them to not do something, and she did it, and then Aisha finds out. Something happened back and forth. Inshallah, we'll discuss this some other time. Something happened that they should not have done. Allah warned them in the Quran. That if you do this, realize Allah is with the Rasulullah and the Sahaba with the Rasulullah and the Malaika with the Rasulullah and all of the Ummah is with the Rasulullah. Don't plan and plot against the Rasul of Allah. Okay? Mend your ways, fix your ways. This is a warning given to our mothers. And it was pointed to you too. Allah says you too. Abdullah ibn Abbas, the Quran says in the Khilafah of Umar, one day he was walking with Umar and 
he had to relieve himself and then he started doing wudu and he's giving the water to Umar, Abdullah ibn Abbas. And he sees nobody is around. So he uses this time and says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, I've been waiting for a year to ask you this question. A year to find privacy, to ask you this question. And Umar al-Rahman is doing wudu. He says, yes, what is it? He says, who are those two women Allah is talking about in Surah Tahreem? Where Allah says, fix your ways, you two. And he says, oh, don't you know? Aisha and Hafsa. Simple. Simple answer. He did not even say, none of your business. This is about his daughter and his best friend's daughter, right? He just gave the answer. And again, I'm telling you this to make us understand that this personal life of the Rasulullah, if somebody says, and I'm sure in, in the subcontinent you will have some people say this, oh, this is the personal life of Rasulullah we should not discuss. Well, Allah is discussing it in Surah Tahrim. You read it every day if you read the Quran. If Allah wanted this to be private, Allah would have kept it private. There is a lesson for us to learn in this, right? So Hafsa Radhiran behaved in a manner that she should not. If something happened, I'm going to skip past it. And the Prophet divorced her. First divorce. Jibreel comes down and says, Allah has asked you to take her back. And Allah says that she's going to be your wife in Jannah. So eventually, Rasulullah took Hafsa Radhiran back and said, Allah says, Allah has vindicated you basically, right? And Allah says that you are sawwaman khawwaman, you are fasting and praying. And she was known for her fasting and prayer. And he was, she was taken back. So before I proceed with what happens when he uh, stops talking to all of his wives, let's just pause here for a second and realize the benefits of fasting and praying. She did something, and I've not discussed this, I know. She did something directly against what the Prophet asked her not to do. She did that. The Prophet divorced her. Allah revealed in the Quran that you better fix your ways. So when he divorced her, Allah said, no, take her back. She's sawwaman khawwaman. So fasting and prayer can get us to places that we can't imagine. We are all going to make mistakes way worse than the people we are talking about right now. So something for us to um, take something positive out of. Okay, so coming now to the incident we were going to discuss today. The neighbor comes and says, Prophet has divorced all his wives. So Umar Dalan rushes back now again to Hafsa. Now we are talking many months or probably a year later, right? Umar Dalan said to his daughter when, when she was saying, everybody does this. And he says, don't let Aisha Dalan fool you, right? And he said, just don't come to the Prophet anymore for asking for whatever he wants. Come to me. Whatever you need, you, come, you ask me. And he's the father. He doesn't have to pay for it now. She's married. But he's saying, just come and ask me. Okay, don't bother the Rasulullah because he's concerned about the Rasulullah. In any case, they still ask the Rasulullah for what they want. They're the wives. They can ask for what they want. And they started asking for a better lifestyle and they wanted more and everything. But Allah has sent the Prophet Muhammad I don't know if you remember, we had discussed this once. Jibreel Islam came down and another angel came down when Jibreel was sitting with the Rasulullah and the Prophet Muhammad was asked, he says, Allah has sent me to ask you one question, Ya Rasulullah. What is it? Allah has given you a choice. You can either be Malikun Nabi, King, Prophet, like Dawud al Islam, he was a king and he was a prophet. Or you can be Abd Rasul, a slave but messenger. Messenger is a higher maqam than a Nabi, but a slave is the lowest of the low and a king is the highest of the high. So you can choose. You can be a king, Prophet, or you can be Abd Rasul, slave, messenger. And Jibreel Islam was lowering his wings, indicating, choose lower, choose lower. And Rasulullah says, Abdul Rasul, I choose Abdul Rasul. And then he leaves. That's all he came for, to ask this one question. And in one way it says, the Rasulullah sees Jibreel and says, what happened to you? You were looking for a turb when you saw this angel. What happened? He says, Ya Rasulullah, this was the angel who has never come down ever. Allah has never sent him down ever. He's the angel responsible for blowing the trumpet. When we're all going to be woken up for our true test on that day. Right? Do whatever you can here, guys. Again, I'm just reminding myself and you guys give 10 bucks, 5 bucks, 2 bucks, whatever you can do. Smile. Because on that day, we cannot help each other. May Allah help us all. I mean. So, that was the angel who was responsible for blowing the trumpet, Ya Rasulullah. And he has never been sent down here. And so, as he was coming down, I thought it's over. Allah has decided to call upon everybody. It's over. I thought it's done. I'm just bringing the wahi down, talking to you. In the meantime, I see this another angel coming down. I think it's over. Turns out it's not over. He still, we still have time. We have this. But from that day, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu used to not even sit like this to eat food. This is there's a bit of a king in us when we go to our house, right? There's a small king in us, you know, sitting like this and enjoying something. Not even this he would do. He would sit like this to eat food, like an abd. Okay? So he obviously he's living the life of an abd. For his wives to demand the life of as if he's a king. And he could have lived the life of a king. He had land and khaybar and everything. He could have given literally millions. Eventually, in one, one day we'll do Fatih Makkah. 
Abu Sufyan was standing and he's looking at this huge, think of it as like a, you know when a plane is taken off and you see a whole bunch of cars, like a rent-a-car facility or something in an airport, you see cars and cars and cars in the lot if you see LAX airport and everywhere. Imagine stretch of land with camels, which is cars at that time, and donkeys, which is trucks at that time, right? You're carrying things. Think of a non-stop piece of land as far as your eye can see. And this is just one person's wealth that has been gifted to the Muslims now. And Abu Sufyan saying, who would not want to take this? Like this is, look at the amount of money there is. And the Rasul is standing, he says, you do you like this? Is this something you like? Like, you know, lots of cars, lots of Lamborghinis, lots of land. He says, Ya Rasulullah, who would not like this? I mean, who would not want this? And in two words, the Prophet just says, it's yours. You like it, it's yours, finished. And can you imagine our happiness if somebody gives us a million dollars? This is much more than a million, what I'm t telling you. Like this, the Prophet gave away. He could have certainly given the life that the, our wives were asking. They were not asking for a million dollars. But if you want to be our, our mother, if you want to be Ummah al Mu'mineen, there is a bit of a sacrifice in, in the sense that you will get much more in Jannah. But here you have to live the way the Prophet can afford to live. And he does not want to expend a lot of money. His most beloved Ali, when he's the one who sees Fatima, her, her hands were scrubby from the washing of the dishes and everything. And Ali then says, why don't you go and ask Rasul Sassam that you can get some slaves from Sufa, from the, from the ones who have just arrived, the new slaves. Somebody can, servants, slave is servants. Somebody who can help us, assist us. And Fatima, the most beloved daughter, the one of the four women whose iman is perfected. She asks him, the Prophet says, how can I give you a slave when the people of Sufa have not had food? Like for days, they've not even had food. People of Sufa were, Sufa was a section in the Medina Masjid which was dedicated to like, here, let's just dedicate this section of the masjid, for example. This is the people of Sufa. And they used to hang on a wire dates or food or clothes or whatever, whoever. So the poorest of the poor Sahaba used to live in the Sufa. And they were the most educated Sahaba because they used to be in the masjid. They would be listening to the khutbah of the Rasulullah. They'd be in the masjid all day, Quran and everything. So they were the most respected, the best uh, of the Sahaba. And the most popular from the people of Sufa was Abu Huraira. And you know, just one Abu Huraira, Pretty much half of our hadith that we're getting is Abu Huraira reported this, Abu Huraira, one Sufa member. Many of the Sufa people have been shaheed with the tragedy of Al-Raja, who were ransomed off. And then in the battle of uh, the, against the Murtad, against in Abu Bakr Siddiq, the wars of Ridda, when the Muslims became, those Muslims who reluctantly became Muslims, in, in, in those battles, the people of Sufa were shaheed. But anyway, but Abu Huraira is there and his legacy lives on. None of our lectures can be complete without mentioning something that Abu Huraira has mentioned. So, what I was telling you is, Fatima Dalauna is asking and the Prophet says, I can't give you because look at, they can, they can barely eat food, right? But things got to a point where they would not stop. And so the Rasul Sassam was, for lack of a better term, he was sick and tired of this. And again, something for us to learn. When you have a problem with your wife, you do not ask your wife to leave the house. It's her house. Again, the culture that we come from, Go back to your house. A'udhu Billah. It's the exact opposite in Islam. You have a problem with your wife, you have to leave for the masjid. So the right way is to leave your house. Do not leave. So if you'll see, inshallah, we'll do one day. Uh, uh, the house of Aisha, house of Hafsa, house by the name of the mothers. Not the house of Prophet 1, house of Prophet 2, no. And so he goes to a small section in his mosque. There was an attic where you had to use a ladder to get up, it was a small little section within the masjid for like, I think of it as an office room or whatever, an attic. What it was, it was a very dilapidated, really small section. You can't even stand completely. You had to crouch to get inside. And there was a fiber mat. That's it. And a little bit of dry bread, dry barley. Omar Adana is going to describe this eventually. That's all he had there. And the Rasulullah is there. And he did a halaf with Allah. He did a qasam that he's not going to come and see his wife for a month any of his wife. This is when the hall of Medina was like, what happened? And so the rumors spread and he has divorced all his wife is what they started saying. And so Omar Dhanam, they banged the door. He says, what, what happened? Had the Ghassan is attacked? He says, no, something much worse has happened. The Prophet has divorced all his wives. Allahu Akbar, he runs, he rushes first to his daughter. He says to Hafsa, has the Prophet divorced you again? He says again. Has the Prophet divorced you again? And Hafsa Dhanam is crying right now because the Prophet has left everybody. This is a really, really a big tragedy for everybody. She's crying. She's not even responding right now. Now, Umar Dhanam gets a little harsh with her. He says, I told you, I, I gave you the warning. Don't let Aisha fool you. And you've not been listening to me. 
if were it not for me, the Prophet would have left you long ago. He would have left you long ago, considering your behavior. And at this, she cries even more. He, and he says, has he divorced you? Tell me. She says, I don't know if I've been divorced. I just know that he has left all of us. So goes to the next obvious person, that is Aisha Dharana, and realize this is our mothers, and they are our mothers, so they are radiallahu anha. But we're talking about a situation where people are heated up, okay? Because the Prophet has left them. And so she's not in the best of moods. And Umar al is not her father. So he comes in with his anger. And the Sahaba are scared of his anger. But the wives is different. They don't interact with them every day. So they have a level that they can get to where the males would not get to with Umar. Um, perhaps it was behind the curtain. Or perhaps it happened before the hijab verses were revealed. Scholars say both things. I lean toward the fact that he was behind the curtain. But anyway. He says, Ya binta Siddiqa, or daughter of Siddiq, Abu Bakr Siddiq. Have you annoyed the Prophet to the point where he has left all of you? Like he's upset, of course. Now she is the daughter of Abu Bakr Siddiq, and she is eloquent, and she goes, Ya bin Khattab, son of Khattab. Because she says, son of Siddiq, he says, oh, son of Khattab, why don't you go ask your daughter what she has done? Why are you coming to me and asking? Go and check with your daughter and see what he or she has done. Anyway, so he just leaves them as it is and he gets to the masjid. Bilal al the assistant of the Rasulullah He's there and the Prophet does not want to meet anybody. He's in the section of the mosque. Think like you were, picture this masjid like 10 times bigger and imagine he's standing there and then the attic is somewhere here. This little portion of the room, somewhere up. And he's standing at the entrance of the masjid and Bilal al says, don't come in. The Prophet does not want to speak to anybody. Not his wife, not anybody. Umar al is then realizing that perhaps the Prophet is thinking he does not want to see me because I am the father-in-law. And this is my daughter's situation, right? And he, his daughter is the one that was previously divorced, remember? So he has this extra guilt. Perhaps he doesn't want to see me because of this. And he knows the Prophet will be able to hear me because he had a voice of a microphone. So he yells from there, knowing that he cannot see the Rasulullah. So he yells out from there. He says, Perhaps the Rasulullah is thinking that I've come here on behalf of my daughter Hafsa. Wallahi, I've come here as your Sahabi, Ya Rasulullah. And if you ask me to slice my daughter off right now, I will do it right here. I'm not coming here as a father. I've only come here to find out how you're doing, Ya Rasulullah. I have not, nothing to do with my daughter. Hearing this, the Rasulullah gives an ishara. He says, come on, let him come in. So then he comes in. He gets into the attic finally inside, and as soon as he has to crouch down, he's a tall man. He sees the size of perhaps three of these tables, and that's it. This is what the Rasulullah now. This I just told you when the Rasulullah gave literally Lamborghinis and Porsche, Porsches to one Sahabi, one out of how many Sahabi, to the point where inshallah we'll do Fatih Makkah one time. In Fatih Makkah, the Sahaba Ansar were actually. Not appreciating this, but again, this is a sensitive thing. They did not like that the, these new converts have just become Muslim in Mecca and we have been fighting so for so many years. They're getting so much and the Prophet doesn't give the greatest khutbah, moves all the muhajir, they all are in tears and their beard were wet when the Prophet doesn't give the khutbah. And basically the Prophet said, are you not happy? I'm going to go with you to Medina. I'm going to, the Prophet is buried in Medina. He was from Mecca, but he went with the Ansar. He promised the Ansar, I'll stay with you. And he's buried in Medina. He stayed with the Ansar. So are you not happy? They get the Lamborghinis. And you get the Rasulullah. Are you not happy? And so when you listen to this, the Ansar start crying. Say, yes, Ya Rasulullah, we're happy. We are with you. Anyway, what I'm saying is our Rasulullah could afford the life of a millionaire per day, every day. You could have had that life. And he, with all the wives that he has, not a single wife he's being with because everybody must have given him a tough time, that he has to resort to lying down on a fiber mat where he's lying down and when Umar is going to get in and he gets up, Umar Dhanam can see the marks of the fiber mat on his back. And he's not wearing the upper garment, he's wearing the lower garment. So obviously looking at this, uh, looking at this life of the Rasulullah Umar Dhanam starts crying. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, why can you not have the life of the Roman kings and the Persian kings? Look at how they live. Because the Prophet literally now, the Ghassan is scared, the Roman Empire is getting scared of, of this. So they be a Quraysh, everything is done. We are in the later stages. And the letters are being written to Rome and they're giving gifts, silk and gold. And this is what's happening right now. The Prophet in, in their mind is like a king. And the Sahaba want the best for the Rasulullah. He's saying, Ya Rasulullah, look at the way the Romans live. Look at the rulers of Persia. 
surely you should be having a better life than this like you're having this and he's of course so sad that his own daughter has given him this treatment which is why he's forced to be here he says surely you de deserve better than this and Umar is saying this crying so Rasulullah says yeah Umar are you in doubt are you in doubt are you not happy that they get this dunya the Romans and the Persians and Allah is going to give us something better in the akhirah are you not happy the point is that, yes, you can seek materialism and you may not get all the material things you are seeking. Allah has probably chosen you to get something much better and you keep chasing the dunya. Maybe Allah has decided you are not going to get this that you want, but I'm going to give you something much better. So be happy even if you're poor. Be happy if you're rich. Be happy with whatever life you have. Anyway, Rasulullah he walks in. He says, Ya Rasulullah, he's standing. He's not sitting yet. Ya Rasulullah, have you divorced your wives? The first question, immediately. And the Rasulullah nods and he says, no. Allahu Akbar, he yells. He says, Allahu Akbar has heard the entire masjid. Alhamdulillah, okay, so the thing they were scared of has not happened. That's just a rumor. Allahu Akbar, the Prophet has not divorced his wife. Okay, great. Now he wants to calm down the situation. Now that we know, it is not as bad as we thought. It's just the Prophet is looking for seclusion. But everybody is making a big deal out of it. Now he's alone with the Rasulullah. So he says, Ya Rasulullah, what a beautiful time we had in Makkah. When we were in Makkah, you know, in Makkah, the girls were very shy and docile and they would not be rebellious. They would not talk back. That was the culture of Makkah. Medina was not like that because the Yahud and everything, Allah has given so many rights to, you know, in the Buddhist religion, in the Hindu religion, just like I told you, right? culture. That's Makkah culture. They're Quraysh. They're Mushriks. But the Torah is there in Medina. The Jews are there. So Allah has given rights to women. So they talk back to their husbands. So in the Madani culture, the girls talk back. No problem. Now when the Makki wives have come to Medina, of the Sahaba and everybody, they have learned how to talk back to their husbands. So he says, Ya Rasulullah, what a beautiful time we used to have together in Makkah. Our wives used to listen to us. Now the, our wives have learned all of these tactics from the Madi Madini girls, and now they are jumping on us. So he's, of course, he's trying to pacify, he's trying to lighten up the mood, make everybody, make the Rasulullah smile. And then he starts telling Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, I told Hafsa, that don't let your pretty partner fool you. And I told her that uh, you're just with the Rasulullah because the Rasulullah doesn't like me, otherwise you would have left you long ago. He started telling all the stuff that he's saying. I've tried to really try to repair these things. And eventually was, the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam starts smiling. And so it worked. His tactic worked. He's trying to explain. He's trying to calm down everybody. And then he says, Ya Rasulullah, can I sit down? Permission. The Prophet says, yes, sit down. Then he sits down. This is when he looks around and he sees there's nothing. There's dry bread. What was the Prophet eating for a month? So that's when he cried and the Rasulullah says, Ya, ya Umar, you're not happy that they have the dunya and we have the akhirah. Finally, when the 20, 29 days are over, the Prophet Muhammad had taken a qasam and a halaf that he's not going to see his wife for a month. After 29 days, which is a month in the Islamic calendar, he leaves, he comes to Aisha. And Aisha says, Ya Rasulullah, you have taken a qasam for one month, 30 days. It's only been 29. And so the Prophet says, a month can be 39 or 20, 30 or 29 days. And so I'm coming, I, I said I'm not going to see you for a month, so I'm here. Now this looks like an innocuous statement, but I want you to think something. The Prophet Muhammad was counting the days. Yes, he took the halaf, but he was missing his wife. And guess what? Aisha Dalauna is pointing out, Ya Rasulullah, 29 days. That means she was counting the days. That's why she knows it's 29 days. So the wives are missing the Rasulullah. They are, of course, regretting what happened. So the Rasulullah then says to Aisha, that Aisha, there is a matter I need to tell you. And I don't want you to make a decision right now. Think about it. Talk to your parents, which is Abu Bakr and, Abu Bakr and her mother. And then think about it and let me know. Basically, Allah is giving you the choice that you want. You can either live this life, the one that you have with me, where he is Abdul Rasul. And what you will have is what you have, right? The life that Rasulullah is offering. Or you can divorce me and you can get everything that you are asking for. Now, when we say whatever you want, I just give the example of a million dollars or ten million dollars maybe, right? The Prophet says, Aisha, don't make a decision now, right now. Think about it. Talk to your parents, consult with them, and then let me know. You can either leave and get whatever you want. You want $10 million, what do you want? You'll get it. Allah will give it to you in this dunya. But you're no longer, no longer going to be my wife. Or you can continue with this life. Aisha Dalauna 
Again, this is an instance where the Prophet says something and she's going to say something exact opposite of what the Prophet is asking her to do. And she says, Ya Rasulullah, is this a matter for which I need to consult? Is this something I'm going to think about? Should I leave the Rasulullah or not? Is that a choice? I've decided, Wallahi, I've decided I'm just going to be with you. Of course, there's no other choice. What kind of choice is this? You can have a million dollars versus you can have the Rasulullah. Right? Again, from this, what do we learn? You know, all of these incidents, there's a lesson for us to learn. I'm just skipping through the, the incident, but we can sit down and write down the benefits of every single incident, every, every single sentence. What is the benefit of this sentence that she just said? What is the benefit of that? What we learn from this is that there are some things in which you don't need to do istikhara and istishara. You see, istikhara is asking Allah, show me the right path. Istikhara is asking the people you trust, what do you think I should do? So there are some things you don't want to do istikhara, istishara. You just do it because it is the most obvious thing in the world. What can be more obvious than choose you want to be with the Rasulullah or leave? A'udhu billah. So <laughs> I was doing this notes. So I just thought, you know what, how much money would that be? You know, the Abu Sufyan, what he was offered in the hole. Let's just say $10 million. So I was just sitting writing it, my wife walks in. So I say to my wife, and understand, my wife is Chinese. English is her second language. She is, uh, I don't know if you know this about China in general. If you say 10 million, they'll check, oh, 10 million, how many zeros? They'll think it's 100 million. So there's a lot of problem in China whenever you speak 100 million, 10 million, 1 million. Okay, that's just normal. I have to tell you this before I tell you the joke. <laughs> So I was writing the notes and I say, my wife walks and I say, um, Sophia, my wife is Sophia. Hey, if somebody gave you $10 million, <laughs> 10 million, and said you have to leave Haris now, what would you do? 10 million or stay with me? Because I don't have 10 million. What would you do? I was thinking, what would she say? And she goes, how much is 10 million? How many zeros? I'm like, what? So there is a number? I need to check. Is it 100 or 10 million? Let me see. <laughs> then I will decide. 1 million? Okay, I'm not going to leave you. 10 million? How much is that? I said, worst answer possible. <laughs> how many zeros are there in 10 million? Oh, astaghfirullah. <laughs> she was just being innocent because Chinese people normally don't understand 10 million. But she could not have said that the worst time. So anyway. So, Aisha did not chose him. But now look at what is happening. Aisha Dalaun says, Ya Rasulullah, of course I choose you. But then she says, don't tell the rest of the wives that I've chosen you. Why? It's a good thing maybe some of them will leave. It's good. Less competition for me. Right? That's what she wants. But the Prophet Muhammad says, I have not been sent by Allah in this world to make things difficult for people to decide. I've been sent to make things easy. I cannot do this. I have to give them all the information. But Aisha Dalaun wanted this, you know, lesser competition. Eventually, all of the wives of the Rasulullah decided to be with the Rasulullah which is a huge testament to the life that they've had with the Rasulullah. And I want you to, again, we have talked about this before, but I want you to understand the life that the Prophet Muhammad had. In his life, the wives sometimes don't talk to him all day. Sometimes the wives are asking for things that the Prophet cannot give or does not want to give. If the Prophet Muhammad can get this behavior from, from our, the best of the women, our mothers, imagine us, and then we are thinking, you know, when I go to my work, even my boss does not raise his voice at me. You know, or my best friends, when they are there, when, when I enter the room, they do this for me. And when I come home, how dare you talk to me like this? Please calm down, right? Eventually, everybody chose the Rasulullah. That was the story of this split. So I guess I'll tell you what happened with uh, Aisha and Hafsa. What is it that they did where Allah had to reveal Surah Tahreen and say that don't do this. How many of you have heard of the incident of honey? There was a honey, because in India, Pakistan, they normally give you this incident. There's honey that was involved. You know the honey incident where the wives got together and they decided to conspire and say, let's, when the Prophet comes, just say there's a bad smell in your mouth because of the honey or something. You've not heard of this incident either? Really? So the common incident that goes is once the Rasulullah was spending time with Zainab bin Tijash and she got some honey and of course there's no fridge at that time so whatever gift you get you just immediately consume it. And so the Prophet loved honey and so he spent a little more time than usual with Zainab bin Tijash so that he can have the honey. Now again we, we don't live in a generation where we have multiple wives but if you have multiple wives the fiqh is the, the, the norm is that you're supposed to visit all your wives before you end up with the wife for that specific night that you're going to sleep with. But he's supposed to visit everybody and then you come home to the one whose night it is. That's the norm. So when he was doing his last round and 
Zainab bin Jahsh had the honey, he spent more time there. And he decided to spend even more time there. And so the other wives, Aisha and Hafsa, they decided, you know what, he's spending too much time with her main competitor, Zainab bin Jahsh. Let's make a plan. How do we stop the Prophet from spending too much time there? And they decided, let's say this, when he comes to Sauda, one of the other wives of the Rasulullah, and when he comes closer to hug you or kiss you, just say, what smell is that? Hmm, you smell like raisin. I have to tell you this because in Arabic the word that is used is this. And of course, the Prophet is very conscious of his breath. In fact, he said, if you have garlic, don't, don't come to the masjid. Like, he's something is conscious. Jibra'il Islam comes down. When he was, when the masjid of, uh, the Medina masjid was not built, he was living in the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari for, for a while. He used to live in the upper floor. He was the only Sahabi who had double-decker house. And that's why he chose that house. Um, and so Abu Ayyub al-Ansari used to send food down. Once he sent food down, and the Prophet did not touch it. Because it had garlic in there. And so Abu Ayyub al-Ansari said, Ya Rasulullah, is it haram to eat garlic? Because he didn't eat it. He says, no. But I speak to people that you don't speak to. That is Jibra'il alayhi salam. And so he's going to take extra precautions. So now imagine the wife is saying, what is that smell? What do you think is the reaction of the Prophet going to be? He's like, nothing, I just had honey, right, with Zainab. But that was the plan. They don't actually have a smell. They're doing this so that he doesn't spend time with Zainab with the Jahaj, the main competitor of Aisha Dharam. And they're on Aisha Dharam's camp, so they're helping her out. He then goes to another wife. that He does the same thing. What is that smell? So now, obviously the Prophet says, and again, 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 this shows the humanity of our Rasulullah, he is still a human being. And he is falling for their trick, a'udhu billah, until Allah is going to reveal the defense. And so, she, they did the same behavior, and so he says, no, nothing, I just had honey. Then finally he gets to Hafsa, she says the same thing. Then it is night of Aisha, he comes, and Aisha is saying the same thing. He says, wallahi, I have, from now on, I'm not going to eat honey, finished. I have made honey haram for myself. This is the normal story that they tell you in India and Pakistan and everything. Um, and it is true, this story did happen. So, he made honey haram for himself, according to this version. And so, according to most of the people who have been studying there, they're going to listen to Surah Harim with this story. And they'll say, to this Allah then revealed that you two wives, that is Hafsa and Aisha, who plotted and planned to be able to get rid of Zainab and Dajash, whatever, realize Allah is with the Rasul and don't behave in this manner. And don't Say something that you don't mean to the Rasulullah. This was a warning given to them. And usually when people ask, what is Allah talking about in Surah Tahrim? They'll say because they plan and plotted with this honey story. You get, you get the story? But the actual story, we have 15 minutes. The actual story, which is, fits perfectly with the Surah, which people usually don't talk about because of the same sanitization culture that we have, where divorce is stigmatized, and, and you know the husbands and wives and this Kanyadan culture. The actual story is that, Hafsa and Aisha Zarawana did something more sinister. So, we all know that our Prophet Muhammad had daughters and, and sons with Khadija Zarawana. Right? After that, he did not have babies with any of the wives. But he did have a son with Maria al qiptiya the concubine, the Milk al We have talked about Milk al before, right? He had Ibrahim with Maria al qiptiya And Ibrahim died at the age of one and a half years, like the best age when the baby can recognize you and he's smiling at you and he's talking to you, but he's not being terrible. He's not running around. That is when you're two years old, terrible twos. So just before that age, the perfect age of loving your child is when Allah takes Ibrahim. So Umm al-Ibrahim, that is Mari al qiptiya obviously you can imagine that our mothers did not get the chance to become mother to the Prophet's kids, except for Khadija. And that's why Aisha had a special ghira for Khadija. But Maria gets pregnant and she has a baby. And the Rasulullah is so happy because imagine he has lost everybody by this time. We are in the end of the life of the Rasulullah right now. And he gets a baby now. What a blessing. So for Ibrahim to pass away was especially painful, especially sad because Khadija Dharan has passed away. Abu Talib has passed away. Hamza Dharan has passed away. Zaid ibn Haris, who was... I know he's no longer adopted because Allah says adoption is over because of Zayd ibn Haris is a brother now. But he was raised in the house like his son, Zayd ibn Haris. People forget the maqam of Zayd ibn Haris. Zayd ibn Haris radiallahu anh, is the only Sahabi, only Sahabi who is mentioned in the Quran by name. There's only one Sahabi mentioned by name in the Quran and that is Zayd ibn Haris. There's indirect reference to Ali, indirect reference to Umar, indirect reference to Abu Bakr Siddiq. By the way, I did not mention this. Uh, when Umar al is sitting with the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that incident, in this incident we just talked about, he says, Ya Rasulullah, if any of the wise give you any problem, 
Realize we are with you. The malaika with you. And Allah is with you. Everybody is with you. Allah reveals the exact same thing. Quoting Umar radiallahu anhu. And Umar Dhan says, Allah has backed me up in three things. He said this. And even the idea of hijab for the mothers, it was Umar Dhan's idea. Because, you know, there, once when the Prophet was married, Zainab and the Jahash. And, you know, Walima and Nikah and all this, people are having fun and everything. So there were some guests who stayed. And Zainab and the Jahash, Walima was huge. It was, it was an amazing Walima. And as Malik was asked in his old age, tell us something amazing from the time of the Rasulullah. He said, the Walima of Zainab and the Jahash was the most grand. We had meat. Meat was supposed to be like the best item. We had meat and rice and everything. Oh, not rice, sorry. Bread and everything. So the Prophet is sitting there. Zainab and the Jahash marriage is over. People are sitting. And they don't leave. They're just doing gapshap. They're talking back and forth. The Prophet is so polite. He does not tell them to leave. He just leaves himself. Hoping that now they will probably leave. But they don't leave. They continue with their chattering. Umar Dalan then comes in. And he sees what's happening. He realizes. He says, get out, all of you. And that's when they leave. And then he says to Ya Rasulullah, we have all kinds of people who come to our, your house because you're the Rasulullah. So it would be nice if our mothers are covered with an extra covering, you know, a partition. This was Umar Dalan's idea. And eventually Allah reveals that for the Ummah the Mu'minin, they're like nobody else. And there's a hijab. And Allah says hijab, Allah is talking about a curtain. Not hijab the way we call it in our language today. What we call hijab is actually khimar, khimar in the Quran. Hijab is an actual partition. This is again Umar Dalan who is being backed up. And the third time when he was backed up was, remember the Munafiq, the leader of the Munafiq, Abdullah ibn Ubay in Salud, the worst of the worst. He, when he dies, the Prophet Muhammad gets up to pray for his janazah. Can you believe what I just said? This man who has done everything imaginable to ruin the religion of Islam, to malign the Quran, to help the Jews who were attacking the Rasulullah assassination. Now this leader has died and the Prophet is getting up to pray for his forgiveness. Umar al cannot take it. Umar al has this habit. He says, Ya Rasulullah, and his face is red in anger. He says, Ya Rasulullah, you're going to pray for this? For this man? Do you not remember what he did when he, on this day? Do you not remember what he did on this day? And the Rasulullah is just standing up, smiling, and he's going to continue. And, he, and the Prophet says, Ya Umar, Allah says in the Quran, Allah says this in the Quran, pray or don't pray, but the prayer for a munafiq will not be accepted. This is Allah saying in the Quran. Look at the Rahmat al Alameen. He's saying, Allah says, pray or don't pray, but the prayer is not going to be accepted. So you don't need to pray, but I'll pray. Because Allah says, pray or don't pray. So he chose the pray, even though he knows it won't be accepted. But you don't need to pray if you don't want to pray. This is the level of Rahmah of our Rasulullah. Like literally Allah is saying, pray or don't pray, I'm not going to accept. Okay, pray or don't pray, I'll pray. Anyway, Umar al had said this, the Prophet doesn't pray. Then Allah reveals another word, says, do not pray for Munafiq. Now there is explicit no. So guess what? Umar al was right. <laughs> so he says, Allah backed me up in this. You can't pray for Munafiq. Confirm Munafiq. Obviously, we cannot call somebody Munafiq. But if it's a confirmed Munafiq, you cannot pray for him. And in, in another revelation, it says, even if you prayed 70 times for a munafiq, Allah will not accept it. The Prophet says, if Allah would have said that he would accept 71 times, then I would have prayed 71 times. Wallahi. Look at the way the Prophet looks around to find a way for us to get to Jannah. Mari al Qiptiya was a source of jealousy for all the wives. She was extremely beautiful, probably the most beautiful of all of the ladies of our, of our Prophet. She was gifted from, by the Muqawqis. Muqawqis is the patriarch, the head of the church of Egypt. Egypt was all Christian at that time. We think of Egypt as a Muslim country. It was all Christian at that time. It was Roman Empire. Um, and he had gifted Maria, just like uh, the king, if you remember Ibrahim al-Islam's time, the king had gifted to Sarah Hajar salam And eventually Hajar then was gifted by Sarah to Ibrahim al-Islam. So the king Muqawqis sent two sisters, Maria and Sirin, and Allah, the Rasulullah gave Sirin to Hassan ibn Thabit, the official poet of the Rasulullah, and he took uh, Maria al Qiptiya. Qiptiya means Coptic, Coptic Christian. Um, and the Prophet Allah gave a, a son with Milk al but not with the wives. And you can imagine they will have their Ghira, and she was so beautiful already. So the Prophet, unlike all the wives, had to house her in Awari, which is like a little further away, 10-15 minutes away from Medina Masjid, just because of tensions. 
and he doesn't want attention. Again, from the story I'm telling you, this is normal. Our prophet is a human being, people will have jealousy, people will want materials and everything. There's nothing wrong with this. That is the reason why we can relate to the Rasulullah, we can relate to the stories. Otherwise, he's a superhuman, he's like Jibra'il, then you can't relate. Thank God for these stories that we can relate and we can apply this in our marriage. So, Maria al khiptiya is the one that was given. He, obviously, she has a baby and everything. Once, when it was the day of her Hafsa, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu goes to Hafsa's place. Hafsa along, takes permission of the Prophet and says, Ya Rasulullah, maybe she has to meet her parents or something. She wanted to go out for something. She, she took the permission of her husband. And the Prophet gave her permission, you can go. But the Prophet came to her house and she left. She left. The Prophet is alone. And it's completely halal. If you have more than wife, one wife and everything, you can call another wife or you can call Bikli Mim. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called for Maria. And so Maria arrives in Hafsa's house. It just so happens that after a couple of hours, Hafsa Dalawan came back to her house and Maria was still there. Okay? And she understood what happened, what transpired. And so she says, Maria, when she leaves, she says, come to the Rasulullah and understand. The wife, they have their anger, they have their, she's the daughter of Umar. You can imagine all this. You can understand there's a reason for the divorce. It's not just happening out of nowhere. So she has a right to object to what she has seen, but she crosses the line. Okay? So she says, Ya Rasulullah, on my day, in my bed, you know, have you ever done this for any of any other of your wives? No, only for me, because your respect for me is so low. I mean, she's emotionally blackmailing and everything. And by the way, a wife can say it. I know we will think like the Sahabi, and for us it's like unbelievable. But please understand again and again in the stories, the wives have a right to talk to their husband the way they want to. They, they can abandon Rasulullah all day. The Prophet never has complained to anybody. He did not even want to meet Umar until Umar said, I'm going to slice my own daughter. He says, Ya Rasulullah, on my day, in my bed, uh, on my day. So the Prophet Muhammad decided to calm her down. He, and any husband can understand when you try to calm down your wife and the wife does not want to listen and so you continue saying things. Sometimes you'll say things more than that you have to say. And so the Rasulullah then says, okay, I will not be with Maria anymore. Hafsa then becomes happy, but then she wants to confirm. She says, well, what do you mean? You're not going to be with her anymore? How can you not be with her anymore? Because Allah has made a halal for you. She says this, Allah has made her halal for you. So he says, I make Maria haram for me. For the sake of placating his wife, he says what we can relate with. And so this sentence, I make Maria haram for me. To this, Allah reveals, how can you make something haram that Allah has made halal? And if we had women sitting here, I would have said this to our sisters. If anyone has a problem with bilkali mean, and you say, oh no, this is haram, a'udhu billah. Realize you have directly gone against the verse of the Quran. How can you say something is haram and Allah made it halal? I don't care the world thinks it's wrong. And, and I explained in great detail last time, last last time, about Milk al the concept of Milk al everything. If somebody has a problem with it, you are doing kufr. Because Allah directly says to the Rasulullah of all the people, how can you make something haram that Allah has made halal? Just to please your wives? Allah is saying this. Surah Tahreem. I'll just give you the first five verses which is relating to this. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. O Prophet, why do you prohibit yourself from what Allah has made halal for you? Seeking to please your wives? And Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. Allah has forgiven you. But why did you do this? Why would you make something haram that Allah has made halal for you? Allah has already ordained for you to, to absolve yourself from this oath. Because he said, I'm taking oath that I made a haram. No, break it. You need to know what happens now. Now is the reason for what the problem starts. Up until now, she has the right to what she said. Yes, and the Prophet placated her. Good. Now the Prophet Muhammad says, don't tell Aisha. Why? Why did the Prophet say, don't tell Aisha? Why would he not want Aisha to know that he has made Maria haram for himself? Because what Aisha, the most favored wife of the Rasulullah, the most loved wife of the Rasulullah, what she could not achieve, everybody wanted to get rid of Maria. What she could not achieve, Hafsa has achieved, her main competitor. She was able to do, she was able to make Maria haram for the Rasulullah, according to her. That's something that Aisha could not achieve. So he says, please don't tell Aisha that I've decided to do this. This is a direct request by the Rasulullah. And after he's listened to what he said, and he's made something haram, which Allah is going to say, don't make it haram. Hafsa Dharam goes and tells Aisha. Why do you think she told Aisha? Despite what the Prophet told her, not don't tell Aisha. Why do you think she told Aisha? Pride. 
I was able to do something that you were not able to do. No, they are best friends, but they are competitors. And this is the line that is crossed. The Prophet told you, don't tell Aisha, and you go and tell Aisha. But then she told Aisha, don't tell the Rasulullah that I told you because he told me not to tell you. Now you understand what's happening? But Allah is on the side of the Rasulullah. And so the third verse is now revealed. Now Allah says, remember when the Prophet had once confided something to one of his wives, Hafsa. Then when she disclosed it to another wife, Aisha. And Allah made it known to him. Allah then told him. That is what she has told him. She has told Aisha. Allah is telling the Rasulullah. And so he presented to her a part of what was disclosed and overlooked a part. So when he told her, so Rasulullah says to Hafsa then when he meets her, so why did you tell Aisha? I told you not to tell Aisha. Hafsa then is thinking, I told Aisha not to tell the Rasulullah that I told her. So she says, who told you this? Did Aisha tell you this? I told her not to tell you. you understand? So Allah is saying, Remember when the Prophet had once confided something to one of his wives and then when she disclosed it to another wife and Allah made it known to him, he presented to her the part what was disclosed and overlooked a part. So when he informed her of it, she exclaimed, Who told you this? Hafsa Adhan says. So then the Prophet replied, he replied, I was informed by the Alim al-Khabir, by the all-knowing, all-aware, the one who is aware of everything. He told me everything. He informed me. Why did you, why did you tell Aisha? So then, fourth and fifth verse and we are done. The fourth verse, Allah is now warning. This is a warning to our mother. It will be better if you wives, two wives, both, both, Allah says both, so two wives, turn to Allah in repentance, for your hearts have certainly faltered. But if you continue to collaborate against him, then realize that Allah himself is his guardian. And Jibra'il, the Sahaba, and the Malaika, notice Allah says Jibra'il and the Malaika separately. That is the maqam of Jibra'il. And Allah sends Jibra'il to the Nabi. So notice Allah says, if you continue to collaborate against him, then realize that Allah himself is his guardian. And Jibra'il, the Sahaba, and the Malaika are all his supporters as well. Exactly what Umar al has said before. And Allah is saying to his own daughter, quoting Umar. Like look at the beauty in this. And the final verse related to this. Perhaps, now see this, perhaps if he were to divorce you all, his Lord would replace you with better wives who are submissive to Allah, faithful to him, devout, repentant, dedicated to worship and fasting, whether pre previously married or virgins. But Allah has said divorce. Perhaps if he would have divorced you, Allah would have given something better. It is from this then, and scholars would say we don't know why the Prophet divorced, but very likely, most likely, this was the reason because this is the line being crossed. And so when he sees, he's th the Prophet thought that Allah is saying, suggesting divorce. And so he divorced. But then that's why Allah then sent Jibreel said, no, don't divorce. Take her back. She's going to be a wife in Jannah. She's a waman qawaman. Yes, she made a mistake. And Allah, radiallahu anha. But I'm telling you that this was revealed for our mothers. And Umar himself was asked about his own daughters by Abdullah al-Abbas, and I told you. And he says, yes, what is the question? He says, yeah, Amir I've waited for a year to ask you this question. Who is Allah talking about in this verse? Those two wives, who are they? Oh, don't you know? Hafsa and Aisha. Clearly told. He did not say, what is your problem? Why are you asking about my daughters? Go mind your own business. Nothing. No, this is, and you, inshallah we'll cover again sometimes slander of Aisha Zarawana, which is literally the slander, the worst of the slander of Aisha Zarawana, is being discussed by the Sahaba, is being discussed with the most close confidants of the Rasulullah. The Zayd bin Harith, uh, his son was Osama bin Zayd, and Ali radiallahu anh. And they were teenagers, like late teenage life. And the Prophet is discussing with them about a situation that um, serious. But anyway, uh, this is the uh, Surah Tahreem. Tahreem means to make something haram. It is called Surah Tahreem because the Prophet made something haram which Allah made halal. And so Allah is saying, how did you do Tahreem on something which I made halal? Anybody has a problem with Kilimeen, keep it to yourself. And the greatest of the human beings of all time, the Rasulullah himself, has come from Kilimeen. Ibrahim al -Islam did not have Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu from Sarah. He had Ismail from Hajar. And she is the one who eventually, after Ismail al eventually after all the generations has Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So our Prophet has come from Milk Amin. And that's why the Jews reject him. Because they say if he was really a Prophet, he should have been sent from the wife, from Ishaq al -Islam. Because from Ishaq al you have all the Prophets. Yaqub al -Islam, Yusuf al -Islam, Musa al -Islam, Dawud al -Islam, Sulaiman al Musa, uh, Isa al -Islam, finally. All the prophets have come from here. And so when the Jews rejected uh, Rasulullah so I'm saying, if he's a really a prophet, he should have come from Sarah. Allah says, when I sent you a prophet from Sarah, what did you do? You tried to crucify him, Isa. So if I would have sent another one, you would have said what? 
oh, we can't accept him as a prophet because he's the, the son of Isa. And so I sent you the prophet from the other bloodline that you respect, Ismail Islam. And now you're saying, no, you should come from there. So you have closed your own doors. You're a hopeless society now, hopeless people, the Jews. Anyway, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.